Hello and good evening. Welcome to the Museum of Science Boston. I'm James Wetzel, the co-producer of Adult Programs, and I am very excited to welcome you to another year of the Real Abilities Film Festival here at the museum. Um, please take this time to silence and turn off any electronic devices, including cell phones. Uh, and we ask if you need to leave the program early for any reason that you do so either up the stairs and through the exit in the rear of the theater or through these front main doors quietly with the assistance of one of our staff members. Um, as I said, we are so excited to have our friends from Real Abilities back here for what I believe is our fourth year collaborating here at the museum. Um, we usually have the honor of presenting the opening night, but this year we wanted to switch it up a little. Um, and so we're really thrilled to be hosting the closing night and celebrating another fantastic year for their team. Um, they're one of our favorite teams to work with. We look forward to it all year long. Um, so I want to give a major thank you to everyone at the Real Abilities Film Festival, especially um, Mara Bresahan and Nisi Clark. Without those two, we would not be here tonight. So a major thank you to both of them and all of them for their hard work. We have um, the privilege of showing you two fantastic um, films tonight. We'll start with Ethan and then transition to Intelligent Lives. Um, in between the two films, there will be a very short transition as we go from film to film. So just stay put in your seats. Don't go anywhere. Um, it'll be very short and we'll get that second film started as soon as possible. Following both of those films, we will have a moderated panel conversation led by Mara um, featuring some very special guests that you won't want to miss. Um, and after that, we'll invite you to the... Uh, uh, closing night reception, which is right across the exhibit hall, where you will have the opportunity to ask any questions that you have and talk to our teams and those special guests at that point. So make sure you stick around for that. But we have a lot of program to get through. So it's my honor now to introduce um, the festival director, Mara Bresahan. Thank you. Such a nice turnout. Um, thank you, James. Thank you, Lisa. It is our pleasure to work with you as well. Um, it's an incredible collaboration. Um, and we're honored to be here. So Real Abilities Film Festival is presented by Boston Jewish Film. I wouldn't be able to run this festival without them. I'm supported by all the staff there and I wanna give a huge thank you because it is the closing night of our probably the most successful fest we've ever had. So um, I don't know if anyone here made it to any other screenings. Did anyone here go to any other screenings? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so we work really hard for this one. Um, so thank you all for attending. Um, the panel we have following this is going to feature Trisha Lampron. She is a film subject in um, Intelligent Lives, Nair Shahid. They're both here, right in the front. Um, and then we have Ethan, the film subject from the short Ethan, the director, Joe Sittenfeld, and Ethan's mother, Cami, who's here as well. So please stay for that. Um, Dan Habib couldn't be here, but his parents are here. So <laughs> they're right there. Um, and Nair's parents are here as well, and they're featured in the film, so you can talk to them all at the reception. Um, I want to thank our partners on this screening, the Federation for Children with Special Needs, the Ruderman Synagogue Inclusion Project, the ARC Mass, um, except and Exceptional Lies for their incredible outreach effort. Um, and then the fest would not be possible without our sponsors. Uh, our major sponsor is the Ruderman Family Foundation, so I want to give them a shout out. And then the Plan Foundation sponsored this specific screening, so I want to thank them as well. Um, and then finally, you got little survey slips. Um, if you can go onto our website and fill out that survey, you enter um, a chance to win a $250 Amazon gift card, but it also really helps us with programming for years to come, so try and get online and do that. And then on the other side is some text to donate information. We work really hard to make all these screenings free. This is the first year every single screening is free. So if you're moved by this film and want to help us keep moving in that direction, you can text to donate. Um, and then I'd love to invite up Kristen McCosh. She is the Disability Commissioner for the City of Boston, um, and, and she's the head of our advisory board, and I'm so um, honored to have her here tonight. Thank you, Mara. Is this on? Can we hear Okay. So uh, thank you very much, Mara. I am thrilled to be here again uh, on the closing night of the 2019 Real Abilities Film Festival. I've been involved with the festival for probably going on five years. First as an attendee, just watching the great films, and then uh, Mara asked me to sit on the board, and so I, I head that up. Uh, we meet over in City Hall, and we really have a great team. There's a lot of dedicated volunteers, and uh, it's just a, a great event, so I, I really look forward to it every year. And I've just been so impressed by Mara's passion and energy and dedication and hard work, so I really, uh, 
have to give a shout out to Mara. Thank you, Mara. <laughs> so as Mara said a few minutes ago, this seems like it's the biggest and best festival that I've ever seen. The turnout's been great, the film's excellent, the panels have been wonderful. So we hope to keep it going for many years to come. I did have the, um, the privilege of meeting Dan Habib a few years ago uh, when he did his film, including Samuel. So I saw that film was excellent. I'm really looking forward to the film tonight, as well as the, um, the film we'll see before that. So anyway, I just wanted to um, welcome you all. Have a great time. Enjoy the films. I hope you can all stay for the panel and for the reception afterwards. I'll be here, so feel free to come on up and say hello. And uh, let me know if there's any accessibility issues we can help with in the city of Boston. That's my day job. So I'm here tonight to just watch the film. <laughs> all right. Thank you, and uh, enjoy the show. Our son, Jesse, had cerebral palsy. When Jesse was four, the neurologist told us that he would never be intellectually normal. We fought to have Jesse included in general education. The IQ test measures a very limited potential of our brain to learn and misses all the other stuff. Naomi, Micah, and Nair, three young adults with disabilities, unlocking their potential. You happy with your tip you made? Yeah. You know what you're going to buy with this? Um, cell phone. I'm getting a nine degree certificate in disability uh, studies. Nair is not afraid to greatly express himself. Do you want to go to college? Yeah. When people say, why is your school successful? Because we include students with significant disabilities. We don't use IQ tests to inform us at all. Not long ago, IQ testing was used to fuel a pseudoscience known as eugenics, which called for eliminating the menace of the feeble-minded. Institutions like Willowbrook more closely resembled prisons than schools. We have to broaden our understanding of what intelligence is. I want my son to go into a world where he's looked at, not there as a tall black guy who's acting weird. Whether it's a police officer or a civilian, you do wonder what's going to happen. I think because of Naomi's unconditional love for what she does, it's good for everyone. Are uh, you on Facebook? No. Okay. My parents don't think that's safe. What do you remember most about today? Be ourselves. Yourself. Can any attempt to measure intelligence predict a person's value or ability to contribute meaningfully to the world? I'd like to invite Nair Shahid, Trisha Lampron. Ethan McGovern, Cami McGovern, Joe Sittenfeld. Just, just, just. Okay, hello. Ah. Another round of applause. That was incredible, right? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so I'm going to start with Nair, because he's right next to me, um, <laughs> if you're cool with that. Um, I'd just like to know a little bit about, a little bit more about you and what you're doing now. Hi. My name is Nair Sahi. I am 19 years old, and I am in the Henderson School Transition Program. I love going out into the community and meeting new people. I work in places like the Daily Table, where I help to prepare food. I work out 
at the Y, and I get to visit lots of places to learn about jobs. Today, I spent some time at the MFA learning about sculptures. I got to use clay to make my own statues. I am an artist and want to learn as much about art as I can. I take a painting class at Math College of Art. I have a mentor named Erin. I am learning how to take the T and use lift to travel. I have a lot of friends at the Henderson, and that's what I love the most about it. Cool, thank you. I know at the reception, I'm gonna wanna ask your parents about how to buy your art because it's incredible. Um, so Trisha, I'll move on to you. Um, I, we, you and I were talking a little bit before and I wasn't aware of any other school like Henderson in the city. Um, not, I don't think one that has such a, a large inc include, I mean, one that is so totally inclusive. Um, if you could give, give us a little back history on the Henderson and where you think inclusive education is going. Sure, thank you. Um, in 1989, a group of parents got together and wanted their students with significant disabilities to go to school with their friends and their siblings. Um, Boston at that time said, uh, that's ridiculous. And so they filed a lawsuit. Um, and Boston Public Schools threw its hands up in the air and said, okay, um, here's a school, good luck. Um, and so they set out uh, on a journey of uh, treating all kids um, with respect and treating all families with respect and giving kids what they needed to learn. Um, in uh, 2014, um, the st one of the things that was happening was that students were leaving us. Uh, we were a K to five school at that time. Students were leaving us after the fifth grade and really were experiencing failure. Um, both students uh, without disabilities and students with disabilities were not uh, in inclusive classrooms. Um, and it, it, it sort of came, came to us as sort of like something we needed to do. So we wrote uh, an innovation plan to the state and asked that we be able to expand our school one year at a time so that by the time we got to 12th grade and transition years, I could probably retire. Um, and it, like all plans, uh, Boston said, that's a great idea, but we have a middle school that's gonna close, and if you merge with them, then you can be the Henderson K-12 if you want. So you have to strike while the iron's hot, and we did. Um, and so we have been a fully inclusive K-12 school, w as well as uh, having a transition program um, for the last five years, five years, this will be our sixth year. Um, and I think uh, what we've learned the most um, is that uh, differences should be celebrated. Uh, differences are strengths. Um, being the same is a weakness. Um, and I think um, what we do uh, really is give kids what they need to learn. Parents sometimes arrive at our school and, and, and sort of come ready to fight for what their kids need. And I say, We're, this is gonna be different. And they'll say, sure it is, but it is. Um, and so the good news is that I get to spend days um, with superstars like Nair, um, who are talented in so many more ways uh, than I am. So I get to sort of relive my life through the talents of others. Um, and uh, we have a staff that's dedicated and really believes that all kids can learn. You just have to create the conditions for it. That's very evident. Thank you. 
Um, Thank you. And Cami, thank you so much for opening up um, your life to Joe. Um, it's a very intimate portrait of you and Ethan and you as a mother. Um, and I know in the film you talked about your, your, you know, your the future for him, and then your son sort of got involved. So, has anything changed for that? For what your hopes are, or um, how you see your like your sons, his brothers' involvement in his life? The, the sibling thread through obviously this film and then Intelligent Lives is incredible. Um, so I just want you to share a little bit about that. Um, there's interesting. Is it on? There. Um, it's interesting the similarities in both movies. I think. Hello, hello. Is it on? You can get yours. Okay. <laughs> so um, it's interesting that um, they both hello? end up on public transportation on their own mm -hmm. with this little knowing smile that makes both of them seem as if they are um, uh, entirely at ease in the world. And we've seen enough to realize that what a triumph that is and what a. Um, uh, and I said, we actually. Um, screened this movie, Intelligent Lives, at uh, an after-school resource center that out in Western Mass where we live. And so this is the second or third time I've seen it. And I think that moment where um, Nair hears that he can, the things he can do in college with art and um, the look on his face is enough to convince everybody sitting here that um, college should be a possibility for all people with um, intellectual disability or, or developmental disability. And um, it's far more powerful than words. Okay, so what was the question? <laughs> the question was about um, the, the siblings future. and the yeah. overall development. Yeah. Um, I think that Ethan, Ethan can tell you a little bit more about what he's been up to and fill in what wasn't in the movies, but um, I think the goal, the hope for every parent is, I have thought there used to be an old notion that if you had a kid with a disability, you kept them at home, that was gonna be harmful to their siblings. And I've actually thought the opposite was true, that of the siblings of kids with special needs that I've known are really pretty extraordinary kids. And I think coming of age in a house where you um, have to help your, uh, for Ethan is the oldest brother, so help in things that they can't do is really empowering. It builds confidence and empathy for the siblings. But there's also this complicated thing. There's the reality that at the other end, there's going to be responsibility. And I think I'm kind of um, waking up to that, to more of that now, that I think it's made his brothers be um, very thoughtful and cognizant of other people in the world around, not everybody with needs, and be pretty nice kids. And that's true of all the special mm -hmm. needs siblings that I know. But um, I also think. Uh, it's we have to be careful that it, it's not overly it's not somehow shadowing what they're choosing to do in their future and um, and that each of it we're gonna each be on their own that they're not defined by that too much I would say cool. and Ethan do you want to give us a little update on how you're doing I'm doing good are, are you still at Berkshire Hills it, yeah I go to Berkshire Hills and uh, how many days mom uh, Two days and two days at yeah, two days a week and uh, Thursday and Friday at the farm, yeah, right? Three days a week at the farm. So yeah, three days, yeah. And uh, some of you, did anybody hear from Boston? What the hell just happened? Well, I think I heard you. Hello. Yeah. Well, some of you may have heard my mom and Joe on the radio, so. Oh yeah, they were on. You were on WBUR Radio yeah, Boston. Yeah. 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 Um, so can you tell them a little bit about what you do at the farm. Uh, can I? Is it okay that I? Is it okay that I? Uh, can I tell what my brothers are up to as well? Nope. Is it, they're, they're care more about what you. I have a question, either. Are you still yeah. with the girl in the in the? You still have a girlfriend? Yes. Same it one. That's true. Yeah, Ashley. Okay. Yep. Okay. Cool. Um, and then Ethan and I talked a little bit before, and I think you're cool with this. But if anyone has extra business cards. <laughs> You're collect, you'll collect them, right? I don't need too many, but... Okay, not too many. <laughs> they have to be really, uh, really good. It, I don't care how much you give me, you know? <laughs> um, we don't have a ton of time, so... I'm and, gonna by, and, and by... Sorry to interrupt oh, you, no, but... 
The music that you heard in the beginning was Bruce Springsteen. Uh, if anybody's a fan, <laughs> so. And I recently saw him in a uh, Hartford with my dad in in the Excel Center. Um, Joe, I just wanted to ask you. Um, well, this is kind of the premiere, right? Sort of. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So very cool. So f you guys are all the first ones to really see this, um, but. Um, I just wanted to know how how this film came to be for you, how you got connected well, to Cammy and Ethan and their story. So, I got confused about which one. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Hello, Chuck. Okay. Um, Ethan seems to work really well. I know. So I first, I, Cammy and my sister were very uh, good friends along in the 90s, is that right, in California. And I met Ethan, I think once or twice when he was, quite young, and then when he was about nine, um, I emailed Cammie and I said, hey, I'm doing a photo project about um, children on the autism spectrum, and I can I come out and photograph your family, and if nothing comes of it, I'll give you a Christmas card photo, I remember. <laughs> um, and I drove out, this was in 2006, I think. Um, I came out and I, spent the afternoon with Ethan and Charlie and Henry and Cammie and Mike, and I sort of fell in love with them as a family and then just spent, I'll have spent a lot of time, like maybe too much time uh, with them. <laughs> okay, I'm forgetting. You have, like, how many kids now? I have two kids. And uh, they're, wait, and they're, Curtis, it's, I Curtis, actually think of, yeah. Curtis uh, is a fan of Bruce Springsteen, right? Yes. <laughs> it's true. But I, th I now I think my kids now are about the age when I met Ethan and his brothers, and I often think about what they were doing, and the wonderful sort of parenting decisions that Cammie and Mike were making back then. The books they were reading, and the thing like I remember, you know, Henry when he was three with a little Easy Bake Oven making pancakes, and think of and Ethan cook like again Ethan cooking when he was nine, ten, eleven, and I think Mike daughter's nowhere near doing that. So I I try to channel my inner Cammie and Mike frequently. <laughs> and my inner Ethan. Um, and Trisha, do you do you have a sense of where inclusive education is going or what, what we can do? I mean, is there sort of a call to action? Or do you think it's heading in that direction? No, Are other schools opening? So I think in Boston we're doing a better job than we have in the past. Um, and we're doing a better job at the younger ages. Uh, for sure, uh, in, in many of the Boston public schools. Um, but systemically, we continue to track students based on ability. We continue to place students in classes based on ability. We continue to value certain abilities over others. And if we continue to do that, then we're never going to reach the goal of inclusion. So I think it's a call to action uh, for everyone in this room um, when you see it. You'll know what it is. When you don't see it, you need to ask for it. And I just have to say that um, Naya's parents were parents who said, this is what he can do. Um, this, is what, this is what he wants to do. This is what we want for him. They advocated for him. They have never once um, given up and said, well, this, he's limited and th this, is what he, this is what he can't do. They, they, the sky has always been the limit, and I think that we need to listen to parents more. Um, I, I, I think when, when we say that we, we respect parents at the Henderson School, we don't um, sort of uh, bar the doors, the parents are here, and let's file the students in in a straight line. It's sort of open the doors, parents come in with your children, come on in and talk to us, tell us what kind of night they had. Um, and uh, you know we do just really m many many small things like that that makes the bigger difference. But you know um, I don't want to talk politics, but in the world we're living in right now, I think it's very difficult time to be inclusive. I think that we're marginalizing lots of populations, um, and so you you really have to say what you mean when you ask people to be inclusive. Um, it's not just ability inclusive, right? It's, it's people from different countries, people who speak different languages, people who got here different ways. Um, and it's being respectful to all. Um, and that's a really 
truly inclusive uh, education, and I think the world would be a better place uh, if we treated people that way. And Cami, do you um, have any advice for parents? Um, any sort of little nuggets that you've learned along the way? Um, I know, you know, Ethan, sort of the, the trajectory has gone in all these different ways that you, you couldn't predict, and then you kind of stopped predicting, and then you kind of let him guide it. Um, and so I'm just curious if there's anything you'd want to share. I think um, the, the great challenge when you're a parent is that um, when, when your child is very young and you first get the diagnosis, the world feels like it has darkened entirely and it feels like such a tragedy for, for a good length of time, for sometimes for years. For, for us, it felt like that for a while, that we would never be um, a normal family or that picture of the family that we would have um, and we wouldn't be soccer parents and we wouldn't and, and Ethan wouldn't go to college and nothing would be what we once pictured it would be. And what I learned when I, um, mostly when I started getting together with other parents that had kids with disabilities and what we all kind of learned, I think, from looking at our own children and from looking at each other's children was how much they didn't feel like tragedies themselves and how quickly they accepted their own limitations and were um, <coughs> delighted with their own lives and eager to get on with them. And it is a lesson that your children keep teaching you over and over, which is, um, that I don't see my own limitations. And I and actually, um, as I've watched Ethan and all his friends get through adolescence, it's remarkable how what adolescence free of self-consciousness is like and <laughs> pleased with themselves and ready to get up on stage. And there is something that we can all learn from that. It is really powerful to see a whole like dance hall filled with everybody with developmental disability and dancing up a storm and loving themselves and their lives. And so that's been probably the number one lesson we've learned from Ethan is to let him be himself and um, choose his own path. And a lot of times that's hard to do because you have other ideas that you want, um, you think that would be better. And there were a lot of things that Ethan chose not to do that would have been the more ambitious thing or would have been, um, and, and I wanted him to, he's got a beautiful singing voice, he didn't want to go out for the, the band or the choir, something like that. He wanted to do something that was easier and that was hard sometimes. And now I feel like Ethan has got, his life is chugging along exactly where he wants it and that's, that is how it's meant to be, I suppose. That's what I've learned. Cool. Well, thank you guys very much. I'm gonna let other people talk to you at the reception. Um, thank you. Thank right across guys, the very, hall. Very Thank you. Um, yeah, let's go eat cookies and brownies. <laughs>